much everybody for being here. Uh, this is one of our smaller Coffee Talk webinars, which is a smaller style webinar for our Here's May Clinical Trial Readiness Program. Um, I'm Ilsa Peterson. I help to manage our programming and uh, I'm pleased to have this group here today. Just as a heads up, uh, and you would know this from the little alert, but this is being recorded. We're going to have this available as um, an on-demand webinar because we know that Timing can be tricky, uh, and I think especially as life picks up, um, schedules are getting trickier and trickier. So, uh, Tina, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, just a very brief introduction to the readiness program that we have set up. So the Curious Make Clinical Trial Readiness Program is a program that has a suite of resources available to um, the, it's it really targeted towards the clinical research community, although I think the resources are much more broadly applicable and we work with a range of different professionals in the context of this programming from our um, PTs and, and clinical evaluators to CRCs and study coordinators and uh, PIs as well. Uh, we have on our website, which um, Patu can drop into the chat for us, it's uh, kerosmade.org forward slash clinical dash trial dash readiness. Uh, a number of toolkits that you can access, um, one on SMA generally, one for clinical evaluators, which is pretty extensive, something like 100 or 120 pages uh, book uh, about outcome measures, which is very relevant to today. Uh, and then we have um, a third toolkit as well for, for CRCs. Uh, we also keep our recordings of webinars that we've had in the past. Um, on that page, or there's a link out to our YouTube channel, and we are recording this. This will be available through that link. Uh, so that's just a quick overview of the program. Um, I think what we can do just from a housekeeping standpoint for the purposes of today is we can have our presenters have cameras on, but I know there's a lot of uh, video fatigue. We will have some conversations. We'll have 20 or 30 minutes of presentation from Tina, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. Um, and then without further ado, Mary, I'll let you give just a little bit more introduction to the industry collaboration, which is supporting this activity. And then Tina will turn things over to you so that you can introduce yourself and dive right in. Great. Thank you, Ilsa. So again, my name is Mary Curry and I serve as Director of Clinical Research at Cure SMA. Um, and in this role, I have the opportunity to lead the industry collaboration, um, which is, was established by Cure SMA um, in 2016 to provide an opportunity for us to work hand in hand, not only with the pharmaceutical companies that are involved in SMA research, but also um, other nonprofit organizations and sites um, and, and providers such as those on the line to ensure that clinical trials that are coming down the robust pipeline truly um, meet the needs of the SMA community. In addition to the clinical trials topic group, we also have three other topic groups with separate areas of focus, um, including regulatory, um, education and awareness, and patient reported data. Um, for additional information on the industry collaboration as a whole, we welcome you to visit our industry collaboration page on the QSMA website. Um, well, without further ado, I will go ahead and hand it over to Tina to start today's presentation. I was trying to do this seamlessly, but um, obviously that wasn't. <laughs> Can you tell me if, if I'm showing the right screen? It looks good. I see. Well, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I think it's the right screen. So we see a map of the world that's made up of people. Okay. It's not the presentation mode, right? It's no, it's not. Okay, great. Okay. Usually I know how to do that, but I, I tried a different system. Um, I, um, I see a few people on the online that is very familiar with this. So I apologize for you having to hear this maybe for the 10th time. Um, but if anything, we're hoping that maybe this will be a platform for some discussion about the ATEND itself or other clinical measures that you're using in the real world setting um, that is applicable uh, for patients with SMA, particularly scales that you're using that may not have been used in clinical trials or um, has been trained or the familiarity of it. Um, today, uh, well, I guess I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tina Duong. I'm a physical therapist at Stanford University. I work primarily um, in neuromuscular, only in neuromuscular in both the clinical world and the research world um, with specialization in outcomes development um, and validation. 
Today, I'll talk to you about a functional measure um, that we uh, made for patients or individuals um, in wheelchairs with extreme motor weakness. The reason I say that is that this was first a scale that was really born out of necessity uh, for SMA. And so as anything that, um, th that is developed, sometimes you need it and then you figure out how to do it, okay? So this is really how it came about. I was in the adult clinic when um, the nurse practitioner asked me to do the chop and tin on a patient. I looked at her and I thought, no, she must be crazy. Who does that? Um, and then she's like, well, you have no choice because the only way the patient's going to get treatment or um, is that um, you do the chop and tin and that's just part of the requirement from the payer. So that being said, um, it was a bandage solution of using the chop and tin on adults. And as you can already imagine, those of you who have used the chop and tin, it, um, there are some obvious items that is absolutely unable to be performed for adults. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit uh, whenever I talk about the scale itself. And so in the next few minutes, we're going to discuss what do you do when a measure that's used in clinical trials are now not applicable to your patient that you're seeing in the real world clinic setting, okay? In the next few minutes, we'll journey through kind of a human-centered approach um, to find a scale that captures weakness and um, motor, motor skills that typically people who have contractures and are in wheelchairs um, may show changes. I like this picture because it um, shows how convoluted getting a patient-centered motor or any outcome um, may look like. As you can see here, this is a map of iterations um, on how to get a patient-centered outcome. You have to first start with the patients. They are the primary person that's gonna help guide what matters in this outcome and the objective of the outcome. And then you identify the concepts. The concepts were identified based on the SMA phenotype that we are aware of, the weaker phenotype, whether it's uh, weaker kids to weaker adults, okay? We did a literature review, and you'll see that as you'll see the development, we have a conceptual model that we um, decide to implement and talk through with a working group for the ATEND. And now with that conceptual model, we are doing the first phase of implementation and administration of the scale for patients with SMA in the clinic. And so as you can see, that is just halfway through the road of where we need to go. Um, because after data collection, as you could see, we'll go back and forth with the patients as well, do some rash analysis so that we are sure that by the time we get to an endpoint of a scale that makes sense for patients, it has gone through the appropriate psychometric analyses and um, in a patient-centered way for us to use in this targeted population. Okay, so what's the purpose of this scale? That's the first thing we thought about. The first purpose, at least for uh, me as a clinician, was to empower the patients to have a scale that really measured something that showed changes in them. As you can imagine, the scale that scales that have been used in clinical trials really didn't encompass this really unique patient population of really weak, older individuals who primarily stay in their chair. So when they do the RULM or the Hammersmith, it, um, it doesn't show the changes. And sometimes that's, that's uh, uh, been reported to me by the patients as somewhat defeating. The other purpose is feasibility. As clinicians, we have a, a, we don't have a finite amount of time to do an assessment. So we have to usually fit assessments into 30, 45 minutes. If you're spending 30 minutes of that time transferring a patient out of their chair, that may, may not be good use of time. And then of course, lastly, like I mentioned before, the scale has to meet the psychometric properties for what a clinical outcome assessment should contain so that we are, we believe that the scale is reliable and is valid so that it may be more sensitive to show changes over time. So how do we empower patients um, as we go through this development process? Like I said before, this is very much patient driven. Our experience with the CHOP a10 is what we call the intermediary um, uh, when we had to do it, um, really helped just make, make us make decisions on what the A10 is currently right now. Um, we um, asked patients about what it is that they do in their chair and what changes would impact their quality of life 
or how they interact with their environment, work, et cetera. And of course, we want to promote an active lifestyle. Are we measuring really what we think we're measuring? Um, and so we try to incorporate um, and think about each item and how that may relate to, for example, getting your hand on a mouse, um, using a keyboard, getting your hand back on the joystick. These are the things that we do ask the patients in conjunction to building some of these items. And so then we think about the key players that uh, will use this scale. First and foremost, the patients. Second, the clinicians. And thirdly, the payers. We are designing a scale that has not been validated in clinical trials. So will it be feasible to use as an outcome measure or an explanation for, for access to treatment? So far, we have been using it and we haven't had any difficulties, but we know in the long run, we need to do the validation that's appropriate um, to ensure um, payers um, um, are familiar with this scale. And to do so, we have to make sure that scale is reliable, it's objective, and most importantly, it's practical. When we talked to our patients, some of the things that they said about the scale was that, not the scale, but um, getting out of the chair, was that, you know, they didn't prefer to do it. Um, it was difficult. Um, it takes time. And a lot of our patients have a lot of um, uh things on their chair to hold them in, a, in an appropriate position. So they didn't feel like it was safe to constantly be transferred out of the chair. Um, and so we looked at the benefit and the risk, and it seems like the benefits of staying in the wheelchair uh, outweighed that of the risk associated with the constant transfers that were required to do the other scales. And then on top of it, the patient said small movements matter. They spend most of their time in their wheelchair. And so what they would prefer to have measured are the things that are important to them in a place that they spend most of their time, okay? Now I'll go back to how we developed the A10. It really came from a lot of the CHOP A10 learning. And I just wanna point out the CHOP A10 is basically the CHOP in 10 minus items 11, 15, and 16. So those are the items where you're required to pick up the child and hold them upright vertically and also horizontally. As you can imagine, this is just impossible in most adults. So the CHOP A10 were all the items minus those three. When we did that, you know, the scale actually worked pretty well, um, as I'll show you right here. Um, in the um, study that we did at um, Stanford, we did the CHOP A10. And as you can see here, we did it in all age groups, but these in the eight, not age groups, in functional groups of sitters and non-sitters. And you could see that in the sitting group, you don't see as much change, but in the non-sitter group, there was drastic, you know, a drastic maybe an exaggeration, but a large slope of change within the 12 month period for this patient pop population. So all that being said, you may ask, why bother changing it? It seems to work. Well, the reason why we are we developed the A10 is what our patients said. They don't want to get out of the chair just to do this scale. Um, as you saw before, how do you develop a scale? You look, you talk to the patient, then you look at items that are most relevant to what's important to the patient. So we looked and we did kind of a heat map based on the CHOP A10. And what it showed us were not only items 11, 15, and 16 on the last two bullets were not uh, were, were something that's not able to be performed. We also found items six, seven, and eight, which is rolling and sideline reaching is just not possible in the chair. So that makes, that makes clinical sense. That being said, now that we've taken all those items from the CHOP A10, we need to add relevant items. So we looked at other neuromotor scales and added items that seem to show some changes for patients as well as relevance for patients. So we took some items from the RHS, the revised Hammersmith, which is hook line, looking at pelvic girdle strength. Um, we took the sitting item, but that became a little um, not feasible. So then we took that out. So the current A10 doesn't have that. Um, we took the EK2 scale items, which is more validated in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but it has some nice arm movements as well as trunk and joystick controls that we found were helpful. So we added those items. And then uh, we took item 22 from the pool 2.0, which is a Duchenne specific upper limb scale to show some of the lifting, um, of, uh, lifting and picking up of small objects that our patients report were important. And then lastly, 
we added the MFM32, which has a finger diagram um, item that shows finger extension and the ability to move your fingers because we found it's very important for those who have minimal function to be able to lift their fingers to have access to uh, social media via their phone, their iPad, or their computer. Okay. And the other reason here that we decided to do the ATEND was that, you know, what we found is when we saw our, the patients that we saw were 11 who did both the Hammersmith and the RULM, you could see there is a really significant floor effect for both of these um, scales. When you look at the ATEND itself, there's really not much of a floor effect and it was nicely distributed among our patient population. The Hammersmith in particular did not show a lot of movement. As you could see, the floor effect and the ceiling effect is only two points, right? And even with the Rome, for those who are really, really weak, it really couldn't detect any change um, for, for some of our patients, hence the A10 being developed. And this is kind of the history of what became of the A10. Remember first, it was the chop in 10, A10 minus, items 11, 15, and 16, and the A10 really did go through its process of finding and review of literature and patient report on what is important, okay? So now we have the A10, which is a 14 item assessment. Um, it's based on two positions in the wheelchair, uh, semi-reclined and sitting. We debated quite a bit on whether or not this should be reclined as in a flat position or semi-reclined. It's hard to say because um, we want this to be general enough for a lot of people to use, but the difficulty is when you're building a scale that's based on being in a wheelchair, there's lots of different wheelchairs and a lots of different supports and accessories to wheelchairs um, in which a lot of our trainings we try to address so that we stay as standardized as possible, knowing the heterogeneity even in the equipment that they will be measured in. The construct's the same as the other scales you're familiar with, in which the higher the score, the better. We have a total score of 46. And like I said before, um, it's based on a few of the scales that are familiar in SMA, as well as other neuromuscular diseases. Okay. And we tried to keep the equipment minimal something that you could just do in clinic. And so as long as they come in their wheelchair, you could use a clipboard, a high-low table, or a weight to perform the entire assessment. And that's all you need. Like I said, the wheelchair is, the, is probably the most, the most uh, um, heterogeneous uh, piece of equipment that, that we have for this test. At the beginning of the assessment, we want to kind of just give, uh, have an idea of how um, uh, how the patients are, what level they are for their upper limb. So we integrated the Brook Upper Extremity score um, to give us an idea of where the patient's functioning, whether they're able to get their hands overhead, functionally only being able to get their hand to their mouth or only doing distal items. As you can imagine, most of our patients fall under the distal items or unable to use their hand um, scoring. And here are the two positions that I mentioned earlier. We test the position in 135 degrees, we call that semi-reclined, and the chair can be an open back or they could be tilted. And so for some of the patients um, or the, some of the countries who have patients um, in chairs that are not power chairs, they we've also suggested it's okay to manually tilt the chair back as long as it's safe and it's in the appropriate position, okay? And we can't talk about this um, population without talking about um, con contractures. So we do have the function of LBC that's on the uh, form, but we will also make a big emphasis that the that these items are based on the construct of movement. So we we expect the clinicians to use their clinical judgment on if the um, with the intent of the item or the construct of the, of the item are they actually assessing what they think they are. So here I show you an example of the biceps. You could see there's anti gravity movement. He has some contractures, but the contractures is really not limiting the ability to move, uh, to access, uh, assess biceps. Then here, this young lady's unable to get um, anti-gravity movement, but she has gravity eliminated movement. So on a manual muscle test, she may be a two, right? The last one's the one I really want you to pay attention to. You can see she has 90 or greater of contractures at the biceps. And because of that, now is she truly as even uh, 
activating her biceps for true bicep activation. And it may be more so of a gravity assisted rather than a true elbow flexion. So those are the things that a lot of the clinicians have to consider whenever they're assessing different joints in this assessment, making clinical judgment um, very crucial um, to the understanding of some of the constructs of these items. Again, here's the test flow, semi-reclined to supported sitting. We did make an effort to make sure this flowed seamlessly from one to the other. Um, there's three major positional changes. They start in semi-reclined, test with their feet together for the pelvic control um, items for the lower extremity, then their feet apart, followed by a transition item that brings them into 110 degrees of recline, where this is a combination of looking at head control in semi-reclined, 110 degrees, and then fully sitting, they'll end the test in full sitting. And this is the worksheet that kind of gives you an idea of the transition, color-coded so that you're always in the right spot. Green is in semi-recline and blue is in sitting. And then now I'll give you a quick kind of stop motion of uh, a video of doing an assessment on an adult. So this young lady, she only has basic hand movements. Um, and I'm assessing her in clinic. And so here you can see that I'm assessing her in a semi-reclined position, looking at her um, upper limit, uh, upper extremity strength, followed by her lower extremity strength. I'm actually using a, a high-low table to position her legs in, but I have also used a clipboard whenever they're too contracted and I can't get them to a high-low table. So you can see that head control is also being assessed here. You can see she has some limitations and head control is also assessed in sitting. And then also upper limb is also assessed in sitting because gravity um, is not nice to the function of muscles and is particularly harder when you're sitting up. So we recognize that those are there's differences in sitting versus recline. And then those the pickup distal items right there. And then that is the last diagram one, all right? So that gives you a general idea for those of you who have not seen the A10 um, on a fast forward motion, what that looks like. Right now, we are currently still in the data collection phase, um, and we're hoping to um, wrap that up and do some initial interim analysis by the end of this year. Um, and again, going into, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention, COVID hit, and so that we decided to see if we're able to do the A10 um, virtually. And so let me somehow try to make this little mouse sound go away. Um, so this is a video of a patient um, doing the A10 with me. I'm in the clinic and they're at home. They have a two camera setup and this was actually suggested by the patient. Um, one gives me an overall view of what they, if their position is correct. The second one, the um, caregiver is actually holding the camera and I'm instructing them to put her in certain positions and then I'm able to assess it, um, the items on some of these scales. And so that has been, that actually worked really nicely. Overall, the test in clinic probably takes 15 minutes and this test do, uh, being performed at home took about 30 minutes or so. So I thought that was pretty successful um, attempt at doing a home visit for our database. We do have the ability to evaluate um, if, it's, if it's a telehealth visit or is an in-person visit, but um, this is not a concerted effort for us to obtain. So we may not have very many of those, but if you participate in our data collection, if you do virtual visits, you are able to also put it in the database as so. And you could see here what's really nice whenever uh, we get to the more distal items, I can see what joystick she uses. And then if you get to the end here, um, she even shows me how she's able to do some of the um, the pick uh, picking up items. And let me see if I can fast forward right there in the diagram. We've had multiple um, A10 training sessions um, so that people can have Q&A as well as discuss anything. And I've also get multiple emails uh, when people try to use this and if they have any questions. Um, my primary role in the development of the A10 as other people are doing it is to have some consistency in the messaging to ensure that when we are scoring and interpreting um, what we score, that we're, that there is a person that's giving a consistent message. And that person um, I'm trying to, to, to keep central as, as uh, myself and the Stanford team. 
Um, and we also actually have um, a all this on the website. So if you or your colleagues want to use this, this is open access. So on the um, Stanford Day Lab website, it has all the current training presentations, the current manuals and the worksheets that you may use um, for this in clinic. And um, if you any, have any questions, of course, you can um, email or call me. Um, and we also greatly appreciate if you have, um, if you're able and willing to, to work with us um, to obtain the data, because we really can't validate this scale with having, without having information um, about its utility. So do feel free to reach out for with us and, and work with us. Um, and we'll happy to help you and make this as, um, as um, easy as possible for you and your team. And that wraps it up for me. I'll have, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, well, thank you so much, Tina. That was, I, I know at least for me, a deeper dive than I've had in our, some of our prior presentations with the poster session where we've had maybe that five to seven minute quick presentation <laughs> and really just interesting. I, you know, I I'd always appreciate process. And so I think it's interesting to get a little bit more to a behind the scenes look at what did it actually take to, <laughs> to develop this? Um, and of course, what if, you know, what have we seen in the last 18 months with, with COVID and that transition as well? Because I know there's just so much conversation happening right now about uh, this tension with telemedicine and this idea that that can be really helpful in some settings, especially if you have people who have limited mobility. On the other hand, those are settings where the evaluation uh, is, is, you know, something that has traditionally been so heavily focused on in-person interaction. Right. And right. so to see that transition and even though like the two camera set up, it's, it's so practical, yeah. so much sense it, <laughs> when you see it, it. Really, really, I was so surprised by that because, you know, it was just one of those things that um, we wanted to have some assessment and we couldn't do, you know, the roam on her because all the equipment that's needed and this was this is low tech enough. And it just worked out so well that I thought this really is something that that we could try using. Um, for our patients. And it really, it wasn't that painful on their end or my end. And, and just to give you some context too, her caregiver, that was her first day. Her care, caregiver no was on kidding. the job doing this. And she did a fantastic job. It was, it was really, it was phenomenal because, you know, with the camera, I can say, I can't quite see that. Can you zoom in on her, on her elbow or her thigh? One of the, you know, it just really, it worked out really well. So neat. Well, thank you. I don't so know much. what the data would say, but practically speaking, it worked You'll, out. Well. Right, right, right. We'll we'll wait and see. I'm I'm sure we'll find out a lot more about that in the next several months. Um, just in, in general, right? What's what's happening with those transitions? So, well, at this point, uh, we would like to invite anybody who is interested. I'm I'm glad to see. It looks like there might be some groups that joined us as well. Um, but glad to see that a few more folks were able to join as we got into the presentation, uh, but would like to invite anyone who has any questions for Tina to, to please feel free to jump in. If you're most comfortable staying off camera, that's just fine. You can stay off camera and just unmute yourself. Uh, if you're comfortable turning your camera on, please feel free to do that. But the floor is open for questions. I feel like I, I, I... I know all these people that have suffered through all these conversations with me that's online right now. <laughs> well, and I do know we're excited to share. This is, a, as I said, is an on-demand feature. I think that's one of the things we've run into with past webinars or the, the ones that we've done in the last year. We did a couple last fall and then a couple again this spring where we just mm -hmm. recorded them, posted them, and that was a nice way of getting them out. And then we can share them in our newsletter as well with folks. Yeah, I mean, I've had some really um, surprising experience and emails from people all over. I, I mean, Asia Pack has, has emailed me quite often, actually, um, about, oh, I'm doing your scale is working really well. Can you clarify what item, you know, three means if they are able to do A, B, or C? So I, there's a lot of learnings that I have every day, and I, I guess you know the reach um, of the of the use of this scale is 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 wider than I thought because of the random you know emails that I'm getting. So it, so I'm, I'm hoping that we could we could um, uh, you know better grow this scale and understand some of the things. I mean that I think the bottom line is this scale has a lot of ambiguities compared to some of the other very strict standardized scales. But, you know, whenever you're looking for a generalized population, sometimes you have to, um, you can't get the best of both worlds. So we're going to standardize it the best we can um, based on, based on 
what's real real world and real world's not clean. So we're going mm, to no. try to make it as clean as possible. That is that is true, isn't it? But well, if, if there are no questions, I do want to just call out and Mary, thank you for dropping all of this into the chat. But uh, for everyone who's on the line, particularly if you have colleagues who'd be interested that you'd like to share information with, um, I would just like to call out that we did drop a number of links into the chat. So there is a message to everybody that has a list of four additional resources. So we put a link to a page on the Curiosity Industry Collaboration. That's just background on the collaboration that'll tell you a little bit more about uh, what this effort is and what it encompasses. It's pretty wide reaching as a whole. Uh, we have a second link on the Clinical Trial Readiness Program, a third with our YouTube playlist, which is of course where this recording will be made available uh, post to Zoom. And then uh, last, that link that Tina mentioned to the Day Lab. And so that's just the link to the landing page. But as Tina pointed out, there is a good bit more information there. And that was such a helpful final slide, Tina, just with all of the action steps uh, and, and where to go for information and how to contact. So anything final from you, Tina, before we wrap up? I don't think so. Um, besides, you know, we real world means you have to think outside the box sometimes. And so this village is big, but yet is quite small. So do reach out um, if you have insights um, that may be helpful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Uh, take care. Great. Thanks so much.